Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be back and in your presence. Do you remember Mr. Yuck? Well, when our kids were growing up, Mr. Yuck was popular. We used to get used to Mr. Yuck stickers. Mr. Yuck was a sickly looking creature. He looked like he just swallowed something nasty. His eyes were shut, his tongue was sticking out of his mouth, posing a huge frown. He was green. He wasn't pretty, but you know what? He wasn't designed to be pretty. Back many, 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 many years ago, lye was used for many popular household cleaners. Remember the Beverly Hillbillies? Granny always made lye soap. And they kind of made fun of it and all. And it, it, it was popular, but many children died from eating lye. Or, or lye. Okay, lye looked like and was packaged like sugar. So many kids uh, thought they you know, ate sugar. Or there were no labels on the packages to warn children of the danger. So finally, in 1927, Congress passed a law forcing the manufacturers of toxic substances substances to label their products as hazardous. And that was fine if you could read, right? Of course, lots of people don't read the labels anyway, just like, you know, when we sign up for something on the internet, we don't read the terms and conditions. <laughs> just hit the button that, yeah, it's okay. Whatever you want, you know, you, you, you win anyway. What about children who weren't old enough to read? You know? Yeah, skull and crossbones, except for, hey, it's pirate candy. Or that's pirate soda. Yeah, whatever. So that's why Mr. Yuck was created. It was it created to teach children that some things are bad and dangerous, even if they appear to be attractive, even if they're in attractive containers or packages. So parents used Mr. Yuck stickers to warn children not to taste what was inside. She put those stickers on bottles, put it on packages, whatever. And little children could easily identify with Mr. Yuck's message. That's a good deal, right? I don't think we do it anymore. Do it? Now we put the child uh, caps, the uh, child protection caps on stuff that we can't even get open anymore. So yeah. So it's a shame government doesn't make us put Mr. Yuck stickers on toxic people. Amen. Yes, that, that, that would be the great thing that we could do. We probably couldn't do it because of political correctness. Uh, in fact, anymore, our society, our culture kind of uh, promotes things that are toxic. But the Bible does warn us to look out for toxic people and avoid them. Especially the book of Proverbs warns us to avoid people who would encourage us to do evil. Now, I don't put all the different passages here, but just reading through the book of Proverbs, the prostitute. Uh, and there's a reason why they're called hookers, right? They get the hook in, and then you're kind of, you know, there, there's something... It, the addiction process, the sluggard, the, the lazy person. You just don't want to be around a lazy person. The atheist, the sensualist. I don't even, yeah, I got the sensualist up there. Uh, the secularist. Think of the danger secularism poses in our culture today. Just live for today, live for the moment. Uh, the covetous. The ignorant, and of course it just goes on and on. You can find so many things in, especially the book of Proverbs, but it's all throughout the Bible. Now listen, these are not penitent persons. The penitent person, you, you're seeking to convert people uh, away from their evil ways, and you're trying to teach them, but, but sometimes you just can't convert people from these things. They're going to stay in those toxic conditions and in those toxic conditions what they're actually trying to do is convert people to their toxicity all right so 
though we have an obligation to teach such people the good way, we have to be careful that their evil way does not rub off on us. And uh, do we ever see that happening in the scriptures? Well, of course we do, and we'll talk about some of those things. But the Apostle Paul gives us the general formula for this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. So that's why, you know, Psalm 1, right? Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, right? There's a progression of things. And, and that's one of the things that our culture, well, the fallen world does it predominantly because it's there all around us, but, but even our culture with the media uh, puts so much stuff in front of us that there it is. It's just constantly like that neon sign flashing. You know, here, here's good, here's evil, here's what feels good, you know. So we got to be careful that we are not deceived into falling into those things. Uh, the Bible gives us examples of toxic people. All right? Now, the first, Cain. Cain was very toxic because he could not control his jealousy. And it starts in Genesis chapter 4. And, and jealousy was the root of the problem. He was jealous of Abel's relationship with God. He was jealous of his brother because his brother was accepted. And then we know what happened. It, it led to hatred, and the hatred led to murder. Okay, And uh, God marked him and sent him away from Seth's people. Now, we don't know how many children Adam and Eve had, but it, it seems like of all of them, the line that is picked up as being God's people is the lineage of Seth in the Bible. And, and that's where you come down to Noah. And, you know, you get to a point where uh, Cain's descendants, especially, and all the other ones, uh, they're very worldly. They reject the Lord's authority over them. You get to Genesis 6 through 8 with the story of Noah, and it tells how that toxic culture destroy all but eight God-fearing people. And we really don't know how God-fearing seven of them were. We just know that Noah was very God-fearing. The rest were kind of obedient in, in following Noah because afterwards there were some problems that came up. But can you imagine that? The toxicity of this one man. And you go and you read about his lineage and look at some of the things that were done in his lineage, Cain's lineage, the men of war, and, and uh, the ones who developed the tools of war are mentioned in there, in his lineage. It's not long after, you know, the, just what, a uh, couple, three generations, somewhere in there. So uh, the, he was a very toxic person, and it, the people of his lineage. Now, doesn't mean they couldn't have repented. They just didn't. They fed into or fed off of that toxicity. The grumblers and pointers in the wilderness at the time of the Exodus were toxic people. And that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us. After they were baptized unto Moses in the Red Sea, that's what Paul talks about, right? They go into the wilderness and they start grumbling and complaining, and it just it changes everything, doesn't it? And, and you, you have people who want to stand up and do the right thing. Oh, when they get to Kadesh Barnea, they send the spies in, right? And 12 spies. Ten come back with an evil report, and in their grumbling, the complaining, all of this stuff, you know what happens? God lets a whole generation of people die in the wilderness. That toxicity just spread all through. The Canaanites themselves, who, who 
the, the children of Israel were supposed to go in and take the promised land from because God had judged them as being a, a toxic people. They were idolatrous, they sexually immoral, uh, they, uh, they, what was I wanting to say? Idolaters, sexually immoral, <laughs> that they'd sacrifice their own children to their gods, their false gods, uh, but they were toxic because of their false religions. And they, God told the children of Israel when they finally went in under Joshua, drive them all out, okay? Drive them all out, kill them all. And you think, well, that's so harsh, right? That, that's terrible. But the children of Israel didn't do what God said to do, and they left a few in there. And you know what happened? That toxicity then came into the nation of Israel. And you read about in the book of Judges, the, the tribes of Ephraim and Dan, how they fed off of that toxicity and led the children of Israel in a large way into idolatry and finally to the division of the kingdoms under uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam led to the destruction of that northern kingdom and finally the southern kingdom too. But again, it was because they disobeyed God but the failure to recognize this toxicity that was there, these toxic people. Uh, at the time of Jesus, the Pharisees were toxic people. Now, well, why were they toxic people? Because they made rules where none existed. Right? They made rules where a rule didn't exist. And the people couldn't handle it. And the Sadducees were toxic because they said, there are no rules. <laughs> you got the ultra-conservative, so to speak, and then you got the ultra-liberal. No rules at all. <coughs> Anarchy and tyranny. Always in this world, right? You gotta be somewhere in the middle. Well, God sent his son to die so that we can know that, number one, there are rules, right? But it's God's rules. God's rules are the ones that are important. And only these rules apply. Not man's rules. Now, listen, there are some rules that men make that are good for us to get by with in culture. We can understand that. Because God wants us to interpret things alongside his rules. But just to make rules to have rules doesn't make sense. Now, uh, that's what we've got today, isn't it? we got a nation of laws. We, we, we used to have, uh, I, I doubt if any one of us could sit here today and say that we haven't broken some law somewhere. Because there are laws on the book that we don't even know about. Couldn't know about. Because what do politicians do? What do lawmakers do? If they're not making laws, <laughs> They're not doing their job, right? No, that's not what their job is to do. Their job is to protect our liberties. But our liberties are there to obey the laws that help us get along together in a civil society. Okay? Protect us. But there you have it. God's rules will protect us. Help us to have a happy life. Treat one another respectfully and help one another. But Pharisees didn't care about other people. Sadducees didn't either. That's why they were so toxic and that's why God's Son fought against them so appropriately. And, and He wasn't their enemy. They were not His enemy, but He quickly became their enemy. Ananias and Sapphira were toxic people because they were liars in Acts chapter 5, right? They were liars. Uh, there were some people that were selling property, giving money to the church because, you know, eventually all those Christians were going to lose everything that they had anyway. 
in that Jewish society, they were considered outcasts. So they sold property, gave money to the church. They were better off. But they lied. They kept half the money, which they had the right to do. But because they lied to God, because they lied to the Holy Spirit, God put them out of the church in a hard way. Why? You can't have a church that functions properly that's filled with liars. And if that toxic environment was allowed to develop, that's what would happen. And, and we see it. We're going to talk about First Corinthians, or we're going to talk about the Corinthian church here in a moment. But think about that. You know, hey, you let this brother or sister get away with lying, gossiping, cheating, whatever. Well, why can't I get away with it? You, you let this one do this. Why can't I do that? And all of a sudden, you go to that Pharisee, Sadducee, tyranny, anarchy. You know that. Which way do you go? Which way? Do you go? Well, the thing is, uh, God took care of the situation there in Jerusalem. Now, he expected the church in Corinth to do the right thing because there's a man there that was committing incest. He was having a sexual relationship with his stepmother, which was still wrong. And he was a toxic person. Why? Because there were some people saying, hey, that's all right. That, that's okay. That's good. Way to go, guy. Yeah. No, that's not good. And Paul told the church that they had to withdraw fellowship from him. And finally, some good people stood up and they did that. And you know what happened? By 2 Corinthians chapter 7, when Paul writes back to him in that second letter, he repented, which means what? He's no longer toxic. And Paul says, accept him back. Accept him back. He's repented. That means he's gotten out of that relationship. He's confessed he's wrong. He's done with it. Now take him back. What a great thing. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Paul wrote that false teachers are toxic and that those toxic people, false teachers, would arise even from within the church. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, and, or, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. Big, big passages there about false teachers. But he also wrote that if we would learn what God's Word teaches, those false teachers can't hurt us. If we'll learn and, and, and want to do what God's Word says, those toxic people can't hurt us. We still got to watch out and we got to stand up to them because we don't want them to hurt people that are growing and, and learning the Scriptures and learning what God wants and, and maturing in the faith. So, yeah, the antidote is given to us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse, four, verse 14 through uh, chapter 3, verse 17. And, and you know what? 16, 7, verse 16, 17, 2 Timothy chapter 3 is. Yeah, all scriptures breathed out by God. Yeah. Prophet, for reproof, correction, for instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished unto every good work. Yeah. That's the antidote. For toxic things, snake bit. Some people allergic to bee stings, all kinds of stuff. What to do? What happened? EpiPen or go to the hospital? Get the antidote, right? Get the antidote, and they're okay. So if they're toxic people, there must be an antidote to toxic people. John writes that Christians who refuse to confess their sins are toxic people. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with God, especially Christ, we, while we walk in if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
1 John chapter 1, verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, that's God, a liar, and his word is not in us. Again, it's not because God has made so many rules that, yeah, there's, there's something we're going to do that's wrong. It's just because we're human beings, <laughs> and we do what? We sin. We sin. Yeah. And, 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 and sometimes it's even unintentional. <laughs> okay? Sometimes we sin intentionally, and sometimes unintentionally. But if we confess our sins, especially to God. Now, I'm of the old school. I believe what's between me and God is between me and God. And I believe it's what, what's between me and another person is between me and that other person. But whatever is public is between me and the church. Okay? And if I sin and it's publicly known, I need to make a confession to the church. I, God, to the person, and to the church. Okay? That means a public confession. But, but again, if we confess our sins one to another and pray for one another, we can be healed. Well, how do we know? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. In other words, be not toxic. But if we refuse to confess, if, oh, I, I did not sin. I've never sinned. I, I'm perfect. That is a toxic person. Right off the bat. And private matters, okay? We get into this. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. So, you know, we don't have sacrifices and altars and things like they did in the, in the Jewish religion, the Old Testament religion, okay? But we can still interpret that into we come to worship service and we're offering the sacrifice of praise, but we know our brother's got something against us, we need to make it right, right? for God to accept it. Now, that's private matters. Public matters, James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be, there's that word healed, right? And you know what that word healed means? No longer toxic, okay? If, if it's sick, boy, we know about that, don't we? We know about that, wear a mask! Well, wouldn't it be great if we could just wear a mask for sin? <laughs> I sin. I'm going to wear a mask today. <laughs> now, I'll get a shot. Yeah, I'll get a shot. No. Con confess? In public? <clears throat> Maybe that's why it's so hard. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And surely we could find one righteous person. Could we? Maybe. Out of a whole group, maybe one. But, but, but the, the idea is that in a group situation, we're going to find one. And in a public deal, you know, say, well, Fred's uh, cheater, whatever. He's cheating. cheating. He's cheating the cards, okay? Oh, I repented of that, and I confessed that in the church, you know? Oh, I don't believe it. There's no witnesses. There's no witnesses. So, again, it becomes that concept, concept of the toxicity that's involved in it. And giving that healing process, the spiritual healing process going in our lives. Because listen, it's not the government's responsibility to point out every toxic person to us. Right? Now, if the government was picking out toxic persons to us today, I'm sorry, we'd probably be on the list just because we we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? 
we'd be the ones considered toxic by the government today. It's our responsibility as Christians to know how to identify, avoid, and then warn others of people who would destroy our souls along with their souls. It's our responsibility as individuals and as a group. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. You know what that means? They're toxic. They're toxic. They poison the hearts of the naive. So don't be naive. Have your eyes open. Study God's Word. Know what God expects. The church does not have to, neither should she, tolerate toxic people. I mean, simple. I think, of course, I'm just a plain and simple guy. And most people will say I'm very plain and I'm very simple. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Hmm? What's wrong with that? Uh, I don't know. Being plain? I couldn't change it. I couldn't change it. You can put lipstick on a pig and still a pig, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. But I'm done. That's the end. <laughs> so I leave you with that lesson. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your attention. If you have a need, please let your request be made known as we stand and sing you.